Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Man. I am excited to be here this morning. Uh, I woke up this morning and I had a frog in my throat. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I don't have anything going on today. Uh, I just got to talk to people twice today. Uh, it's all good. Thanks, Mark, for preaching about spiritual warfare last week. That's cool. No, it's good. No, it's really good. Um, if you're new here, uh, welcome. My name is Chris, and I'm the healing minister here at the cross, and I am really actually just incredibly excited to be able to bring our message this morning as we are uh, ending this series we've called A Letter to the Church. We've been walking through First and Second Corinthians. Now, I, I don't know if any of you had anything to eat last week because you probably are still picking that steak out of your teeth that Mark gave you last week. You know what I'm saying? That thing was good. It was like, man, we, it was just an unbelievable message about spiritual warfare. And I, I know for me, it just incredibly blessed me throughout the week. And, and then I woke up this morning and I can't talk, so it's great. Yeah, it's, it's all, it all makes sense. Um, but he was on fire last week, and so we are, we are ending this series here uh, today, and we've been walking through both of these letters, and then after this service, we are having baptism today. Um, both services, there's going to be new life. That is what revival looks like, and we are going to be doing that today, and we are called to do that as the church. Jesus says this in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Baptisms, making disciples, professions of faith, these are all directly connected to the words in 2 Corinthians. So throughout this series, we've been studying these letters, and Paul has been doing exactly this what it says in Matthew 28, verse 20, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So let's start this way. Last week, Pastor Mark opened the sermon saying, had anyone ever been in a fight? <laughs> like fisticuffs. Is there a cooler word than fisticuffs? I don't think there is. We're going to start a little bit different this morning. A different question. Have you ever taken a really, really difficult test? Like one that you had to pass <laughs> when everything was riding on it? Uh, when I came to in high school, I was not much of a student. Um, I came to, I remember, I uh, didn't do so well in tests. And I was sitting there in my Spanish class, senior year, and finally I just kind of pulled my head off the desk, like drool coming down. And I remember my teacher, Mrs. Luke Arati, and I was like, uh, Ms. Luke, uh, that's what we called her, uh, what do I have in this class? And she said, a gift, Chris. A gift. <laughs> D minus. Mi espanol es no bueno. <laughs> so, not very good. Um, I didn't do much testing in that class. I do remember when I took my licensure exam to become a licensed clinical social worker. Now, this is a pretty intense test. You study for it. It costs like 300 bucks to take the test. If you fail it, you got to wait months before you can take it again. You got to pay for it again. And I remember getting through it and it's like digital. It's going to give you the answer right then. And I like hit submit and it goes, are you sure? <laughs> I'm like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> I was feeling pretty confident until you said that. Uh, I don't know now. And so I'm like, oh, Jesus. And it's like passed. I'm like, yes, yes. I mean, I don't care if it was by one, it doesn't matter, passed. But you know, it's important. I have a license to meddle in people's lives, so it's kind of a big deal. <clears throat> but I remember one test specifically um, that, I, <laughs> that was just really cool that I was thinking back on in the week. My dad, this is kind of cool because it was the 80s, my dad's a black belt, It's kind of weird. He said, my dad's a black belt. I grew up with my dad being a black belt. I remember going to when he did, like, he got his brown belt, and they were, like, sparring, and I was like, is my dad going to die today? Like, is this okay? Are they going to stop this if it gets out of hand? And he became a black belt. And then I was like, oh, yeah, you know, you register your hands as lethal weapons. I don't even know if that's true, but it just that's what I told all my friends. And I was like, man, my dad's a black belt. It's awesome. So then I wanted to start doing, you know, taekwondo or karate or something, right? And, and there was a show on in the 80s, you may remember, it was on from 86 to 87. We got a picture of it right here. Sidekicks. Does anyone remember this show? Just me. So that, I literally had that outfit that that kid's wearing right there. And that's Ernie Reyes Jr. His dad, Ernie Reyes Sr., is like a Taekwondo master. 
And this guy, he actually went on to be one of like the Ninja Turtles in the Ninja Turtle movies. This guy's awesome. And I would just be sitting there. I'm like, dude, I'm going to be Ernie Reyes Jr. And so I went, to, I started getting into Taekwondo and I got my white belt because they just give you that one when you start. And then, um, <clears throat> and then I did the thing and I got my yellow belt and I'm cooking. And now it's time to get my orange belt. Man, so like we drive out to like where we've got to do this test, and I'm just like, I don't even know if that's any of the stuff. That's all I remember. I don't know what I was doing. And and there was a rumor that Ernie Reyes Jr. was going to be there, right? So I get there, and like it's time for the orange belt, like for us to come up and earn our orange belt. And there's like eight judges, and there's like eight of us kids, and Ernie Reyes Jr. is my judge. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's the guy from Sidekicks. He's a little older than than that picture now. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I'm like, I will not disappoint you, you know? Like, <clears throat> and I give it everything. I earned my orange belt, man, and I was so excited. But here's the thing. <laughs> I don't remember anything about Taekwondo. I don't remember a single move, nothing. The only reason I remember that test is I remember who my judge was. <laughs> and I remember it because I wanted to make my judge proud. I wanted to make my dad proud. That's what I remember. When we fully understand the character of the one who is judging us, we will no longer be performing out of fear, but we will be obeying out of respect and out of love. This is a complete sidebar, but I have to share this. So now my son, who's crushing it and growing up in the church, which blows my mind, here I am, can barely pass Spanish in high school, and my kid's crushing it. So he's in the internship program, and, you know, he comes up with me on Thursdays, and he's working on some things and some stuff, and I walk in, I'm like, hey, buddy, what are you working? He's like, I've, I've done some things, and he took that cop photo that we saw earlier. You guys check this out. Look, look what he did with it. I walked in, look at that deal. <clears throat> Is that amazing? <laughs> I, Mark is the best 80s cop television guy I've ever seen. I would watch that show every day. I feel like that should have been our spiritual warfare graphic. Come on, Satan. I knew it would crush here. Like Lake County, Mark's got a gun. Y'all eating this up. It's so good. <clears throat> uh, we do not need Maury Povich. That is my son. <laughs> so we are good. We do not need a DNA test there. He is my kid. Well done, son. (laughs) So what I want us to have in mind here is that we get the character of the judge wrong. And I want us to walk through this. And and we are now in the end of 2 Corinthians 13. And Paul is going to walk us through this. So here we pick it up. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 1. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier on any or any of the others. Since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. By the testimony of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. That is Paul quoting Deuteronomy 19.15. And he quotes it in reference to his coming visit. The point of this quotation is to remind the Corinthian Christians that when he comes, he's not coming this time to investigate anymore. He's coming as judge. Raise your hand if you like being judged. (laughs) Yeah, uh, right. Just like personally. Like someone going, yeah, now I just want to judge you right now. No one likes judgment. (laughs) And yet we all do it. We all judge others and we judge ourselves. Yet we are not always just judges. Our sin prevents us from judging justly at times. Paul has investigated the church in Corinth. He knows what they have been up to. He is essentially saying that if you have not repented and changed your ways, when I come and visit you next time, it will not be good because I will be judging justly. Verse 3, since you are demanding proof of Christ speaking in me, Paul's opponents at this time, the most eminent apostles among the Corinthian Christians said they wanted to see more power from Paul. I mean, they essentially were saying he was kind of boring when he spoke. They thought he was too humble, too weak. And so Paul is addressing this. He's essentially saying, okay, you want proof that Christ is speaking through me? Fine. When I come the third time, you will see the power of God in my rebuke as I clean house. Look, we all think we want 
God's justice and God's power, we should be hitting our needs, begging for mercy and grace. We want his grace. That's what we want. Verse 4. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him in our dealing with you. Just as Jesus displayed weakness, yet now reigns in power, Paul will come in a similar way, showing the Corinthians his weakness. But Paul is saying, don't change on account of me, but remember who your real judge is. And then here it comes. This is verse 5. This is the verse that we all need to humble ourselves and meditate on. Examine yourselves to see the, whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do, not, do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail that test. Paul asks the Corinthian Christians a very sobering question. He says, am I really a Christian? <laughs> we are rightly concerned that every believer has assurance of salvation and knows how to endure the attacks of the evil one. This is what we heard last week. And at the same time, we also need to understand that there are some who assume or presume that they are Christians and they are not. This is a challenge to all of us. The Bible makes it clear of those who are genuinely saved and righteous and holy, but not by our works, not by anything we can do, but through Christ. Yes, sinners gonna sin. Sinners are going to sin, but with decreasing frequency. And a true believer hates their sin and repents of it, hungering and thirsting after what is right. That is why we obey God and love others. Hear me this morning, church. We are not looking for perfection. We cannot get it. We are looking for transformation. Are you being transformed by the gospel? We've been hearing a lot from Paul over these weeks as we've read his letters. And let's just, this is how Paul struggled with sin. I know you're familiar with this verse. Let's hear it in a new light this morning. Romans 7, 15 through 25. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Making a decision years ago, walking down an aisle in an altar call, reading a tract on how you can accept Christ is not a biblical criteria for salvation. It may be how your journey started, but the real issue is what does your life look like right now? Is sin and unrighteousness, does that characterize your life? If so, there's a strong possibility that you are like me and you are like Paul, a sometimes disobedient Christian with sin still in you but your sin is convicted by the Holy Spirit. But if it doesn't bother you, there is a possibility that you are not a Christian at all. What Paul is pleading with the Corinthian church is to do the same thing that God is calling us to do right now, to examine ourselves. We need to right-size ourselves with God. So here's an easy way to do it. You and I, have nothing to do with our own creation. Nothing. Nothing. You didn't make you. You didn't create anything, really. I mean, unless Elon's in here, right? 
Name one thing that you have made, created, or invented. You're done. Nothing. <laughs> you live in a world that's been taught to you. You have nothing to do with it. Nothing. And if you're like, well, I named my kid, well, you can barely take credit for that. I mean, you, did you make the reproductive system? You did that? When? On your spare time? Look, men, we get to do kind of the fun, easy part. Women, like even your you have a baby. It's not like one day you're like, today I'm going to make an elbow. No. Today I'm going to grow the synapses that connect to the polyvagal nerve. No. We're hosts at best. We've done nothing in time. Nothing. How do we not realize that? And then also realize that a fully holy God who does not need you, created you, made you, knit you together in your mother's womb because he loves you, because he wants to spend eternity with you. When you have that revelation, you will hit your knees every single morning and realize that I can't, but he can. I can't, but he can. Proverbs 1.7 for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Do you know that you are a sinner in need of saving? Do you have a relationship with him? Do you dwell on and in his word? Do you pray to him? Do you listen to him? If you want to know, if you are a Christian, compare your life to the standard that we see in the Sermon on the Mount. One word summarizes his standard, righteousness. How do we get into right standing with a holy God? Well, we can't. <laughs> we can't. Not on our own ability and strength. We are only made righteous through him. So this is Matthew 5, 3 through 12, known as the Beatitudes. I'm going to read these nine verses, which read like a roadmap to salvation. And then we're going to go back through them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Only those who admit their spiritual bankruptcy, that I have nothing to give, can enter into the kingdom. You show up at the kingdom, you're like, what's the key? Admitting that you don't have it. <laughs> Hitting your knees, spiritually bankrupt. Acknowledging that you have nothing to give. That's how you enter the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit. It speaks of being poverty stricken in one's spirit. And then verse four says, as a result of that inner poverty, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Those who are broken and mournful over their sin receive salvation. When a person is poor in spirit and mournful about his sin and meek, he will then hunger and search and thirst for righteousness, and he will be filled. Verse 6, have you come to Jesus absolutely shattered over your sinfulness and hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Those who are entering the baptismal waters today are saying exactly that. They are saying, I can't do this. <laughs> I need you. I cannot do this on my own. I'm taking all I know of myself towards all I know of you. And I'm laying it down and I'm stepping foot into the waters of baptism. I am hopeless without you. Some people come to Christ as though they're doing him some kind of favor. <laughs> some of us Christians are like, man, I hope this famous person becomes a Christian. Because like, wouldn't that be great? All their influence. Like, we come to Jesus on Jesus' terms. That's it. On his terms. Mourning over our sin. Desiring righteousness. When someone comes on God's terms... The Lord makes him merciful, verse 7, pure in heart, verse 8, and a peacemaker, verse 9. And then because of what he is, because of that transformation, people will persecute him, verse 10, revile him and say false things about him, verse 11. But he will rejoice 
because he is a citizen of the kingdom. Verse 12. We are called to examine ourselves. And this does not need to be like a long examination. You don't need to like go to the Himalayas on like a 40-day fast to see this examination. Just be honest with yourself. Do you see fruit in your life? Do you see it? Jesus says you will know them by their fruit. Not like you will kind of have an idea. You will know them by their fruit. Are you being transformed? Would someone who hadn't seen you in years recognize you? <laughs> I think back to my, me with my head on the table, Spanish class version of me. <laughs> I think of all the friends I had in high school. They would be like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. What are you doing now? <laughs> what? You mean like the atheist spiritual, like listen to music, man. That guy? That guy. The guy who just loves the Beatles? I thought that's what you meant by all is need, you need is love. Now you're like, no, it's Jesus. Oh, and you do this like on a Sunday sometimes? Come on, come on. You're full of it, man. They would have no clue. <laughs> no clue. And that's a good thing. We should all look different. And amen, a lot of us do. A lot of us are being transformed right now because of his great love. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 through 13. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail that test. Verse 6, and I trust that you will discover that we have not failed this test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not so that people will see that what we have stood the test so that you will, will do good, you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed, for we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. In verse 11, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. We're not getting into that today. Come another week. All God's people here send their greetings. Jesus doesn't want us to simply conform. He wants us to be transformed by his great love for us. His great love for us. There is no rejoicing without repentance. There is no rejoicing. Not real rejoicing. Not without repentance. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, he says. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. This is the rhythm of a believer. Reflect, repent, rejoice. Reflect, repent, rejoice. This is why the psalmist can say this. Psalm 51, 10 through 14. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then I will teach transgressors your way so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are my God and Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. So many of us miss the mark, and I don't just mean miss the mark in our sin. I mean we miss the mark in understanding the character of God, truly understanding his heart for us. I want to share a story that I heard years ago, and every time I think about it, it just wrecks me. There was a boy, he was in high school, and he had had a dream, like a real revelation of Christ. And he wrote this short story about it. Just this beautiful revelation. And he then died in a car accident. And the parents then read 
this short story at his funeral and many were saved. I'm gonna give you that story. This is what his dream was. His dream was he walks into this warehouse. It's this huge warehouse, it's dark, it's dusty. And there are just rows and rows and rows of file folders from the floor to the ceiling. And he's walking around and he comes up to the first drawer and he pulls it open and he pulls out, he sees it stacked with paper all the way. Every single one of these drawers stacked with paper. And he, and he pulls out that first piece of paper and he starts reading it. And it seems familiar and he goes, oh, this is when I was like five and I like lied to my parents. <laughs> what is this? He puts it back and he reads the next one and it's a time where he was kind of mean to his sister and again lied about it, said he didn't start it, but he did. And he starts going through this thing and he starts pulling over other file folders and he starts realizing that all of these papers, it's all of his sin, all of it. Revelation of a high school kid seeing that he's spiritually bankrupt. He starts going through every single one of these things and he's reading all of them, all of them. He goes, this is all of my sin. And right when he realizes that, a door opens in the distance and the shaft of light comes flying through. He can't tell at first, but there's a silhouette in the doorway. And he starts walking towards him and he starts to realize that it's Jesus. And he says, no, 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 you can't be in here. Not with all this, this is too much. You are holy, you cannot be near this. And Jesus just walks over to him. He doesn't say anything. He just grabs him by the hand, takes him over to the first file folder, sits him down. Gives him a little smirk. He opens the drawer and he pulls out that first piece of paper and he signs over it in his blood. He puts it back. Grabs the next piece of paper, signs over it in his blood, puts it back. And he says, all of this? I got all this. I came for the sin of the world. I can do this all day. I've got all of this. It's all covered in my blood. That is the revelation of Jesus, a God who loves us. And we miss this. We think that he's going to throw his wrath on us. He already did onto his son. When Jesus is sweating blood in the garden before the crucifixion, he says, Lord, take this cup from me, the cup of God's wrath. But he says, not my will, your will be done. And he goes to that cross and he takes on all of it, all of it. Everything we've ever done, he's taken it, all of it. That's what we reflect on. That's why we repent. That is why we rejoice. That is what we do. We're going to partake in communion here in just a minute if you have your elements. And I want us to stand in this place. There are a couple questions I want you to reflect on as we take communion together in this space. And the first one is simply this. Do you have an intimate and loving relationship with an everlasting and perfect and gracious Father? If the answer is yes, amen. Amen. If the answer is no, I want you to reflect on this second question. Do you want one? Do you want one? He wants one with you.